It's just been so quiet. It's Sunday. Yeah. Is everyone waking up? How's your Sunday going? I know our voices aren't warmed up yet. It's only 10.45. Uh, hi, everybody. How's your C2E2 going? How's day three starting off? All right, all right. We do have the hashtag. If you'd like to uh, comment about this panel, as it goes on, you can use the hashtag GeekMentors. So please use your Twitters, your Tumblers, your Facebooks, your MySpace, your Friendsters. Friendster. <laughs> Everyone that's 30 and up is chuckling. If you're under 30, you do not get the joke. <laughs> that in itself is the joke. Great. Uh, my name is Aaron J. Amendola. I'm going to be your moderator for today. I'm joined by four panelists, all of whom uh, I respect and admire within the community. We're going to be getting to them in just a moment. This panel is called, With Great Power Comes Great Responsibility, Mentoring the Next Generation of Geeks. Now, it's pretty much self-explanatory. There, there is quite a bit of mentoring that goes on within the Chicago landscape in the geek community. And these four all have uh, very good best practices and ideas on how to make that happen. The structure of this panel is going to be a li little bit different than your typical panel. What we're going to do is uh, take questions at the start. So we're going to introduce ourselves. During this time, please think of questions you'd like to ask, and then I will get them from all of you, and we will talk about those questions as the panel goes on. We've got about an hour. We should be able to get through everybody's questions. So during the introductions, if you can think of something, keep it in your mind. And when we're done, I'll ask you for your question. I'll write it down and then we'll moderate the discussion from there. Sound good? I got a woo, that's great. <laughs> I'm now dreading, I just realized my face is gonna be up there eight feet tall. Fantastic. <laughs> Feel good? You gave me the picture, it's I, wonderful. Did I give you the picture? I don't yes, remember yeah. giving you the picture. Uh, why don't we start all the way down on the left. Uh, give us your name and the last three projects that you worked on. Sure, my name is uh, Wesley Sun. I'm the communications director for Sun Brothers Studios. Uh, the last three projects uh, we've done, I work with my brother, I'm based here in Chicago, my brother's in Boston. Um, the last three books we've worked on are three uh, comics and graphic novels. Uh, the most recent is Monkey Fist, uh, which is a twist on the Journey to the West Monkey King stories, but recast in a fast food restaurant, uh, where he's trying to figure out where his burgers come from. Prior to that was Apocalypse Man, which is our survival horror zombie riff. And our first graphic novel, uh, Chinatown, which came out in 2012, is something of a haunted house story about a little girl who goes missing in Chinatown. Hi. <laughs> I was too busy met, uh, tweeting out a geek mentor hashtag photo. I'm sorry. <laughs> yep. Hey, I'm Natasha Lomack. I wrote a book on Afrofuturism, the world of black sci-fi fantasy culture. I tour around speaking on that subject quite frequently. I'm also the author of the Rayla 2212 and Rayla 2213 series, uh, which follows a war strategist on a planet 200 years into the future, or former Earth colony, rather. Uh, she's a time traveler and it engages some reincarnation and identity questions as well. And I'm working on a film called Bar Star City that I'm gonna be shooting here in Chicago this summer uh, that looks at a south side bar that's a portal to other worlds. And I've launched a short story series called Chasing Black Unicorns that's a, a prequel series for that that's also available at uh, my table F8. Sunrise salutations, thank you. <laughs> I actually got one of those uh, Chasing Black Unicorns prints this morning. It is awesome. You should totally get one. Um, my name is Mitchie Trota, and um, I do all the nerd things uh, here in Chicago. I am the managing editor for Uncanny, a magazine of science fiction and fantasy that is published by Lynn and her husband, Michael. Um, I am also uh, a blogger, an essayist. Uh, I blog about geek culture uh, and occasionally food. You will find tasty recipes also on my website uh, at geekmelange.com. Uh, that's also my Twitter handle, uh, geekmelange. And I am a fire and manipulation, uh, object manipulation artist with the Rax Geek Belly Dance and Fire Performance Troupe here in Chicago. Thank you, Mitchie. Hi, 
Uh, I'm Lynn M. Thomas. Um, as Mitchie said, I was, I had, we, Michael and I had the stroke of genius as the co-publishers and co-editors of Uncanny Magazine to hire Mitchie as our, our managing editor, which may well be the second best choice we've ever made other than deciding to be a couple. <laughs> um, <laughs> it, you know, it, it, it's made a huge difference. Um, I, in my day job, I'm a librarian. I'm the head of special collections at Northern Illinois University where I archive science fiction and fantasy authors. Um, like I literally take them and put them in mylar bags like on The Simpsons and nail them to the wall. It's really fun. <laughs> uh, I'm also, uh, I'm a podcaster. I'm a member of the Verity podcast where six women from across the globe talk about Doctor Who and argue a lot because that's what we do. And uh, I'm a, 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 I, I, before, I, before Uncanny, I edited anthologies, um, and the one that I'm best known for is one called Chickstick Time Lords, which is an essay collection about, hey, no, really, women have been in Doctor Who fandom all along, you're just not paying attention. <laughs> uh, and that won a Hugo Award in 2010 for the best related work, which is the nonfiction category. Uh, a podcast about arguing about Doctor Who, I never would have thought. <laughs> There's a lot of them. It, there are, there are, as, as I understand it, yes. Um, so, uh, you're probably wondering, what, what do I do? No one's wondering that, but what I do, I most recently came off writing the songs Man of Feel, Romance Under a Dark Night, and Brightest Day, Sexiest Night for the Love Songs of the DC Universe. Uh, I currently produce a show, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry, I said your love songs of the uh, Star Wars Universe. Love Songs of yeah. Star Wars Universe was Meet Me at Toshi Station, uh, I love you, I know, and a bunch of other terrible puns. Uh, and I currently produce the show, The Geek Show, a nerdy variety talking thing, which is a uh, community show that is uh, designed to engage the Chicago community and promote uh, inclusion within the landscape here. Okay, so, based on what our panelists have told us and based on the puns that I just gave you, you probably have some amazing questions. What I'd like to do for the next few minutes is just take your questions, write them down, and then we will moderate the discussion from there. Uh, does anyone have a question that is burning that they want to be the first one up? You, miss. How do we get the younger generation to not put up with the crap that you guys put up with? I mean, that's my burning question is, you guys have all put up, I, I know some of you, and I know you guys have all put up with a lot of crap in your careers and in your upward, wonderful upward trajectories. How do we get the younger generation to not put up with some of the same crap you had to deal with. Great. That's a, that's a really good starting off one. How do we get younger kids to not put up with crap? <laughs> I, I literally put that in, uh, in quotation marks. Does anyone want to follow that one up? You? With the next generation, I know that there's been a theme lately in the media, social media about bullying. And how do you what, plan to use mentoring with accepting themselves as a geek instead of, you know, allowing the bullies to tear them down emotionally and not accept themselves. So how do we deal with bullies? How do we deal with the issue of them not accepting people for, for what they like? Correct. Great. Okay, I'm, I'm discovering I have a doctor's handwriting right now, so we've got a lot of shorthand. Okay, that's two. Can I get a third one? Okay. Mine's kind of about like meta mentoring. Like, how do you get other mentors to ascribe to the attitudes and goals that you have in mind for the next generation? That's a good question. You've been hanging on to that one, haven't you? I have. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> to learn. It looks like I'm writing prescriptions. Great. Uh, any others? Are you back? I'm going to take new to also mean like early 20 something. So, like, nerds are becoming going to adulthood. How do you culture an environment in your nerd community that you're welcoming of maybe like 20 somethings who don't feel like they'll fit in outside of the internet? How do you just kind of bring them into the fold and let them know that they're accepted? Sure. Kind of like how I, I didn't play D and D ever until a year ago, and I was like, yeah. "How do I do this?" And now everyone's like, "He didn't play D and D." <laughs> My goodness, that's a great question. Uh, all right, any others? Any others? You miss? Uh, I would. I was wondering, how do you feel um, the evolution of the perception of geek culture uh, in a mainstream sense would influence the advice you give a young geek now? As opposed to the advice you would you would feel you would have when you were younger yourself. 
Sure, so like the, the identity of geeks in mainstream culture today is way different than it was 10, 20, 30 years ago. Yeah, what, I, I, you know, what, what do you feel like you would have been, you know, taught if you had a peer you were talking to them as a geek, what do you feel like you would say to them then about, you know, getting into geekdom in the broadest sense versus what you feel like you know now, what would have changed? What would, how would your answer have evolved? A real, a real back to the future quandary. <laughs> what, what would you do if you could go back and, well, I guess, try to hook up your mom and dad? That's, that's really good. It's very different. Uh, <laughs> Any others? We've gotten a lot from this side of the room. This side has been silent except for one. Any questions over here? Any questions over here? All right, great. If you uh, if you think of any others, we will be asking for more at the end. But uh, let's start up at the top. Uh, okay, so why don't we start? I'll go left to right. Sure. Uh, Wesley, yeah. how do we get the uh, younger generation to not put up with this crap? Uh, yeah. uh, obviously, it's, a, it's, a, it's vague, sure. but uh, there's a lot of crap that can go on. Yeah. Uh, how can we get the younger generation to evolve past that and uh, move, move forward? Sure. Well, I, maybe, I, I should have, maybe I should have said this when I introduced myself. So I, when I'm not making comics, I teach at the University of Chicago, and I'm the faculty advisor to the Comics Books Club at the University of Chicago, which is called UChi Comics. Uh, and some other students have been running an internship program for the last uh, three years, where we, uh, we take a college student. Most of them have from, been from UC. We took one from uh, DePaul. Uh, and we take them with us to conventions, to, to shows. We help develop their properties, their work, uh, and also kind of teach them the ins and outs of the, of the self-publishing comic business. Um, the, the sort of crap that I've put up with uh, in, this, in this industry has mainly been about um, and this, I think a lot of the questions are about a certain kind of accessibility, like who are the gatekeepers um, to let someone in or out, or where, where might some person find access to colleagues uh, and, and access to collaborators. Um, what I'll say is that um, I don't think there's a way for me to prevent crap from happening. I don't think that's within my, my abilities. I think that um, what I might offer to a young person, say a college student who's interning with us, um, is kind of, of, of ways of navigating through it. Right, and so uh, um, our interns, and there's been three of them. I'm sorry, uh, four of them, um, have been people of color, have been people who are queer, transgender, um, who are into comics, a variety of topics, uh, and and uh, maybe underrepresented in their field, maybe bullied, maybe other ways. And so I think that it's part of building a larger um, community. In, in the, uh, among my faculty colleagues at the university, we have a saying which is to never teach alone. That is to say, if you want to be a good educator, you'll consult with your colleagues, you'll bring in guest lecturers, you'll, you'll read other people's stuff. I would say don't mentor alone either. Okay? I am not, there are some things that I can speak to as a person of color. There's some things, there's some things I can speak to as a comic book writer. There are other things that I don't have first-hand experience to. And so for, for me, part of helping a young person navigate through the crap that might come up in this industry is by consulting with my colleagues. Uh, who can speak more directly uh, from their own experiences. And so I would say that, that although I can't stop crap from happening, um, I can consult uh, and seek out other mentors for my mentees uh, to help them navigate through this world. Interesting. Uh, sure. Well, it, it's interesting. What I usually do is um, I very much create events and have conversations around the subject of Afrofuturism. So I started a group um, with a, another gentleman, and we call it Afrofuturism 849, and we'll do events from time to time. Uh, there might be discussions or, or movie screenings uh, around Afrofuturism. We might talk about sound theory. We might talk about trying to, try to envision the future. Um, and more recently, you know, I've developed these dance classes uh, that kind of encourage freestyle dance and experiential Afrofuturism. So what I've kind of found is that, at least in the, the case of Afrofuturism, it's a fairly new term. The concepts are not. So there are many people who very much connect with those concepts, but they, you know, just because of the way people are socialized, didn't always feel comfortable talking about them in public. You know, maybe they were kind of talking about quantum physics and black culture, you know, with a few friends, but didn't feel like it was socially acceptable. So when I create events, and then we can talk about these concepts, you know, broadly, 
people are almost surprised that it's acceptable to have these conversations in really public spaces. Um, it, because in the context of Afrofuturism, it, it intersects technology, the imagination, liberation, and then um, also mysticism. So it it's almost doesn't necessarily fall in what we typically would call geek culture, because it's, it, it has those intersections. Uh, and then there's a heavy performance arts component to it as well. So what I found is the more we, we create events and engage people in the conversations, the more they feel comfortable in their own identity and being able to express in these shared spaces. And that's kind of where the life and the vibrancy comes. You know, people are able to find one another. So fortunately, we have the internet where people can connect there. But then these live events or these live conversations really give people a platform to feel like it's OK. Yeah, I kind of think it's also like the community part is really, is really important. And I think one of the best ways to kind of bring people in and show them this is how you can navigate a lot of these barriers. Here's how you can figure out to find your own way is to model the type of behavior that, you know, that we would like people to, to, you know, to take after. While also having, being aware that what has worked for us may not work for everybody. It's having empathy, it's being able to listen to what somebody is telling you is their, their specific problem. And as you know, Wes has pointed out, if you can't address that problem directly, it's important for you to have a network of other people with experience that you can reach out to and say, hey, I have a, I have a student or I have a friend uh, who's new in the community who's navigating this problem. I don't have the tools to help them, but I know that you do. Can you help us out? Uh, so building those networks and being able to offer not just your experience and being able to offer your support, uh, being able to offer the support and experience of the people that you know in your network and communities, that's a great way to make connections that will help bring younger people in and help show them, like, you don't have to go through the same kind of where do I go, who do I talk to that you may have gone through when you were new to the community. Whether you're talking about a new student or someone who, had, who is way into adulthood who wants to become part of the community, it's always important to be able to say, I have a door that you can go through, but if this isn't the door that works for you, here are many other doors that other people can show you through. So, um, Sorry, I was writing down quotes. Okay. There's so many good things. Um, I'm going to kind of build on what Mitchie's talking about. Um, I'm going to do the awkward thing. I, I'm the only white panelist sitting up here, which is really awesome. It's, a, it's really, really awesome to be the, the vague unicorn in this sense for the first time. <laughs> you are a space unicorn. I am a space unicorn. Um, one of the things I want to talk a little, about, a little bit about, and I'm going to admit up front that this is going to be awkward because um, it always is, is to understand the privilege that you may have, whether you feel it or not. Um, I'm, a, I'm a white woman. I'm queer, but I'm a white woman. I'm a gatekeeper. I have to be aware of those things every time I interact with anyone. I have to be particularly aware of those things when I'm interacting with someone who is from an underrepresented community. Because my job is not only to build the kinds of spaces that are warm and welcoming and um, where people feel comfortable wandering through the door, I have to not only build the space and open the door. I have to be at the front door saying, hey, you're welcome here too. It's part of my job as the person who's in the position where there can be, that there is privilege whether I feel like I have privilege or not, and that varies based on every conversation and how many white dudes are in the room. <laughs> um, part of the job is not just to build the space and the door, but to make sure that I'm helping other people along wherever I can. What privilege I have, I'm trying to leverage for the forces of good, essentially. Um, and to not be a jerk. And when I hose up, which inevitably I will, because I'm raised in the same society that we all are, and it's racist and sexist and homophobic and ableist and a whole bunch of other things. Um, when I hose up, because inevitably one does, um, to try to fix it, apologize profusely, and try to not hose up in exactly the same way repeatedly. You know, it's, it's, it's about not doubling down, and it's about being the kind of person that I would want to meet in a crowded room. Um, and to just understand that what we share is enthusiasm. And if I can build on that, then I can help build a community. Um, and to make sure that when I'm making choices as a 
gatekeeper, because I'm an editor, that I'm, I'm, by definition, I'm a gatekeeper. I'm making choices about what gets published and what doesn't from our slush pile. Um, when I'm making choices, I, I also have to be very aware of making sure that when I am building a product, it looks like the world that I live in. And the world that I live in is not white, and it is not straight, and it is not everybody's not able-bodied, and I have to be aware of those things and make sure that the, that our product actually reflects the world that we live in because, A, it's good business sense. Um, there's lots and lots and lots of evidence that diverse products sell better because, hey, there's a whole bunch of people who feel like they have not been seen in media, and if they feel seen, they're going to say, shut up and take my money. I mean, this is, this is a, a, it, it's a transactional thing. But at the same time, it also means that we're building better media because the more that people are seeing, the more that, that white, straight, ableist stuff is not the default anymore and it's not what the world actually looks like and that's how you slowly shift the culture. But as a gatekeeper person, it's part of my job to attempt to shift the culture as much as I, I personally can, which isn't as much as I would like, generally speaking, but I can try to make it at least suck slightly less than it did the day before and that's pretty much my metric. I think that's also, it brings up uh, like how we make people feel more comfortable is by modeling, like again, modeling that behavior. Like if you screw up, and you will, we all have, it's the best thing we can do is not suddenly, suddenly make the people who have called us out suffer the consequences for calling us out on our missteps. That is one of the worst ways that you can make people feel unwelcome, that you can make them feel like it isn't like they have to put up with that crap because if they're if they're af too afraid of the consequences of calling out crap, they're not going to want to be in the community. They're not going to be pointing out things that maybe you are not aware of and you're not doing on purpose. So therefore, you're going to keep perpetuating these problems. You're going to keep making the community not as welcoming as it could be, and you're not going to know because someone's going to be too afraid to tell you. So the crap that we put, that we have put up with is not nearly it's not as bad because a lot of us have been vocal. A lot of other people before us have been vocal and have put up with even more of it. But seeing people stand up for it and what it's not just seeing people stand up for it that has made that made me feel more confident in taking part in different key communities. It was seeing the support that people calling out crap were getting from gatekeepers in the community, that they were getting from people who had clout, who didn't really have anything at risk, but were still willing to say, no, this is wrong, you should not be giving crap to this person for pointing out this problem, because they are doing you a service. It is not fair to, to jump all over them for showing you that the thing that you liked actually wasn't perfect. Interesting. Uh, I, I, I love some of the points, uh, Wes, that you can't prevent things from happening, but you, there are ways of uh, uh, managing through it. Uh, Natasha, I definitely want to talk to you more about those dance classes, because that sounds very cool. Uh, in, in Michi Lin, uh, with the ideas of, of the doors and, and having to be at the door and saying, come in, please, uh, and being proactive about it. I think those are all very good points to make. Uh, kind of piggybacking on that, uh, bullying. I think. Uh, it seems like that's a trope of the geek culture to have been bullied at one time or another. Um, how can mentors uh, help prevent bullying and probably more so, how can mentors help uh, people move past bullying so that it doesn't happen kind of in a circle? I think we have to val really always make sure that we are validating someone's feelings when they come to us and tell us that they have felt bullied, that they have felt unwelcome. As much as we may not want to hear it because maybe it's coming, it's, it was at the hands of somebody that we like or a community that we really enjoy, you don't want to second guess or invalidate somebody's feelings. You don't want to tell them that, oh, no, so and so didn't really mean it that way. Or, you know, you're just like, you just need to be less sensitive. That's a personal one I absolutely hate. Uh, because that is, that is going to put you off on the wrong footing, that is going to mark you as somebody not trustworthy, that they can't come to. So that is a huge thing I think we need to start off with, is saying that, you know, is validating that your feelings of feeling unwelcome are real. Let's talk about it and let's see what we can do to actually help you 
isolate the problem, figure out how to deal with it that will work for you. What can I do to support you? You know what's really striking me? Um, I feel like I walked into the geek community backwards. Uh, meaning that, and, and I'm just gonna speak kind of from a somewhat cultural context, right? Uh, it, it, within the African American community, if you had geek qualities, for you to function, you had to be overly social. So you had to play sports, you had to, you know, know how to play a lot of games, you had to be able to dance, I mean, just to, you know, all these social factors. And so a lot of people lived lives where they were hiding their geekness. Their geekness played out maybe in the jobs that they would take later. And so a lot of the conversations I wind up having are where people's inner geek is like coming out. Mm -hmm. So maybe there are certain things they always really loved, but they would never talk about it. And when I look at my personal experience, you know, I was, uh, I was, I don't even know how to explain it. I think it's almost like this double identity. Uh, and you're negotiating them, and then at one, some point in your life, you merge them and you fuse them and you express all of it. Uh, but it's at that point that I discovered there was this larger geek world. Uh, and that was well into the years when I was about to write Afrofuturism. So this is somewhat, you know, this is kind of fairly recent. And I think about that and I say, okay, why didn't I know about the depths of the geek community? You know, I was, you know, in all kinds of schools and doing all kinds of stuff and in science and all of this. And I realized because there was no gateway to the geek community. You know, the geek community was um, uh, more or less monolithic in many ways. And so there wasn't an awareness of Comic Cons, there wasn't an awareness of sci fi cons, there wasn't an awareness of all these various groups and organizations. And granted, there are many more now, and we have social media so you can find them more. So I'm always like perplexed by that, that concept, right? And so. When I think about, you know, the, so the concept of access to me, uh, what I realized, let me just put it this way, being at this particular Comic-Con, uh, and whenever I'm promoting it and I'm saying, hey, I'm here, for some people it's like, oh wow, it's okay to be there. You know, so my presence in some way signifies that to people. And it's like, oh wow, if I come, I'll be able to find product with black characters in it. Or I'll be able to find something with black women. I just won't be walking around and you know, people are acting like they don't know, they don't want to talk to me, or there's nowhere I can go, I can at least go there. And that's not to say this is a hostile environment by far, right? But there's just a fundamental thought of, gee, it's, I'm not welcome. And I didn't realize how ingrained that was for so many people until I started doing this, these cons, and people would say, oh wow, you know, I'm gonna come because you're there. And it's like, oh, this is, this is kind of heavy. So I, I just, so I'm sort of mesmerized by, not mesmerized, but I, I'm constantly in wonderment or, or fascinated by that because to just the presence of having you know, more diverse people and the opportunity to get diverse product and, and come to a, a table, for example, where that's okay, shifts things and fundamentally makes people feel like it's fine for them to walk in, although there's no sign saying don't come, mm -hmm. right? So I it's what's not that. said. Right. Well, it's, it's about what the default assumptions are. Mm -hmm. Because the <clears throat> the notion of the geek community, the way that we're talking about it now, is to a certain extent it's relatively recent. I mean, the, the rise of the, of the giant comic cons is what twenty years old ish, um, you know. And in my day job, I work with a lot of older science fiction and fantasy fans, people who are part of organized local regional fandom in the 70s, where like they would take different names in fandom because they were convinced they would be fired from their jobs if anyone knew they were fanish. It was that level of fear. Um, and I spent a lot of time explaining to them that the geeks have actually won the culture war. Like, you know, <laughs> The Force Awakens kind of tells us that geekery is something that is mainstream now. Um, and, you know, just a little bit, you know, but when folks begin to explore their geekery in an environment where they're convinced that there is going to be a problem if they express it of any kind. Um, part of being welcoming is having to model that, no, it's not a problem, really, it's okay. Um, and that's, 
challenging to do, but maybe that's just challenging for me because I only became a geek like 15 years ago when I married one. <laughs> so I'm a geek come lately, really, by most people's metrics. Did uh, any of our panelists have like a late awakening of their geek? Because I, I specifically remember mine came when I was about 16 and I was like, I can talk about Pokemon with other people. I can have friends this way. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I don't know that I, I'd be, I mean, I've been a, I've been a geek since I was very small, but um, oh, gee, yeah. I think the context for which I lived out, my interests have changed. I never went to comic conventions until I became a professional. Um, my own, I mean, even though I'm very social and I like to talk, and if you come by our, art, our artist alley table, I'll talk your ear off if you ask me about our books. You really will. I'm actually, <laughs> yeah, I will. Um, I'm actually quite introverted, and, and the, 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 the Comic Con context is not something that actually kind of naturally appeals to me. There's like a lot of like, people and noises and like you gotta like, like push past people like a lot of it, it just it my kind of introversion uh kept me away from comic book conventions i started going because uh, our books were going into production and i i kind of looked at the landscape of this business and although we sell things in bookstores we sell things online this is a business where you really need to meet people face to face and i've come to love it i really look forward to uh, comic book conventions and c2e2 is my favorite but that's something that it wasn't until, uh, let's see, our first book was published in 2012. So it wasn't until 2011 that I started attending C2E2 and other conventions. So that was a new world for me to navigate. Um, and so I don't know that um, my, my geekdom came late, but the context did. And I think when, with our interns and with our students, that's often the case. That's often the case that our, our students, it's not that this is their first time reading comics, but it is sometimes their first time at Comic-Con or even if they've been to Comic-Con, the first time on the other side of the table at Comic-Con, right? So my intern, Luke, I think there's a slide going around of, yeah, of his work. This is his debut show. I really encouraged him. You should, he's got a lot of web comics. I said, can we develop one of your projects to put it in print? You know, and I, I guided him through that process. Would you be willing to put it on the table for people to look at? And, and, I, and I know the original question was about bullying, but if I throw in also things like reading critique or criticism or you know, people not liking your stuff. I think there's a lot of work to do to prepare somebody. Like, you need to be prepared for people to come to the table, look at your stuff, make a face, and walk away. You know, if that's something that will be either triggering for you or just will, will discourage you greatly, I need to prepare you that that's the nature of this business. Um, you know, it, because you meet people face to face, they are, these are things that you, can, you cannot hide behind a pen name or behind the screen, not that bullying doesn't happen through screens, I'm aware of that, but people will be aware of what you look like, who you are, your body type, your race, your voice, these are things that people are gonna meet. And so I think that reframing the context in which you live out, like this is my intern now, Luke, has been doing comics for a while, but this is his first experience seeing face to face how people treat his work. Uh, and some of it has been very gratifying, when people are like, oh, this is amazing. Uh, and some of it has been discouraging for him. And so I think that that, it's worth mentioning that, that the context for your geek life um, can come, it can change, I think, rather rapidly. And it kind of comes back to what you said uh, uh, before, you can't prevent it from happening, but there are ways of managing it. That's right, yeah. Um, sorry, I just wanted to get to Yatasha's point, I think about I think visibility and showing how there are a variety of people who are at these things, and particularly if you're in a marginal, if you are part of a marginalized community that has been told in so many ways, and not even not even verbally, just visually. Like, if you open a book for a comic con and they show pictures of who who have been past attendees, these are things I started paying attention to. Now, where I'm like, wow, these are great pictures. They're super white. Um, it is. It helps to deal to even like just short circuit any of the impulse for bullying. Or, to, or even make you feel like maybe it's going to be less of an issue if you just look at a crowd and you can see that there are more people who look, they all look different. Um, I know if I go to a Comic Con and I see that there are more people of color, I know that this is more likely to be a place where I'm going to feel more comfortable. Um, when I see things like anti-harassment policies up there, I know that if I experience bullying, if I experience harassment, there are fake, there is a framework in place where I can go and get help. I can have it dealt with, and nobody's going to tell me how I have to deal with it. They're going to give me options. They're going to they're going to support me, and I think that's also really uh, that's also really important when it comes to helping people feel more comfortable with 
the possibility of bullying with actually having been, been bullied. There are a whole bunch of different factors in there, but the visual signs that we can give to make people feel comfortable without even having to say anything, those are really important. You know, and I really feel like um, it's about developing, encouraging an inner resilience as well. Because, I mean, in my case, and again, you know, I'm kind of, uh, I don't want to go, just sort of sentimental about this because it's sort of interesting, you know, just the, the evolution through Comic Cons, but I'm thinking about it and uh, I've never really thought of myself as being in spaces where I was rejected, right? And part of that is because I don't care. You know, I, I'm there for whatever reason I'm there for and I don't have to explain that or necessarily justify it, right? And that's kind of the spirit that you want to encourage people to have. I mean, it's not always congruent with being a geek, right? But being a geek doesn't necessarily mean like you have to step back from, from who you are and asserting yourself, right? There's still a space of asserting, hey, I'm here, I belong, and you don't have to screen it from the, the rooftops necessarily. But to, to believe that and feel that and to just be in these spaces and encourage it because the reality is people may make you feel uncomfortable. They're going to say stuff. They're going to do things. Uh, and, you know, you just have to kind of let it roll off and just say whatever. Uh, but see yourself from a, a standpoint of being empowered rather than, you know, shrieking, you know, being the shrieking violet and feeling as if you're constantly being victimized. Which isn't to say people aren't doing that, but it is to say if you walk in the door thinking that way, then it's just going to heighten and manifest itself. So if that's not the, the thought process, then you, you come in with a level of assertion around who you are, and all of those things fall away, I mean, generally speaking. And I kind of feel like that's the way to go about it in terms of at least how I, I work with people. Um, but generally speaking, I mean, I've had quite a few interns who've worked with me, and they're walking around here at Comic-Con. I didn't even know they were going to come, you know, people who I've worked with in the past. And, and they wouldn't have been here, you know, otherwise if they hadn't worked on certain projects. And so it's just sort of fascinating. I'm thinking about a young lady uh, who's a student at Olive Harvey, a community college here. And someone had referred her to me because she, you know, did great art. She did some poster art for me. And I said, oh, come to Comic-Con, you know. And, uh, you know, I gave her a pass and she came in and she almost made it. You know, I mean, it was just like, it was like, wow, this world exists and I can be a part of it. Uh, and I said, yeah, you know, you, you do some more work, you have your own table, you know, apply and you can be sitting right here. And it's just like, really? Yeah, you know, I mean, so it's, it, it's interesting to see how these smaller moments uh, have, can have such large impact. Uh, but even beyond that, there is this, this case of just trying to cultivate an, an inner resilience as well. So uh, we, we talked about the awakenings of uh, people's geek in younger kids. And uh, I want to get to the question about how do we cultivate that for, for older people? Um, my mom is 74. She discovered the X-Men about a decade ago. And now whenever I go home, we talk about the X-Men. It's adorable. I wish I had known about this earlier. Um, thank you. <laughs> she loves you, Jack. Um, I mean, I mean he's, he's also a musical theater major. I love him myself. Uh, how can we help cultivate uh, geek communities for older people, people that maybe didn't realize that they liked these things, and now they're you know, in their, uh, what we consider old 50s? I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> we just keep pushing that. Just, yeah. 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 So, yeah. So, so people are 90 years old. And just, <laughs> uh, they just discovered Steve Ditko. Um, how would we help foster a community for, for people that may have felt like they missed out? Well, I think it's the same way that you foster a community for people that are just, I mean, when it's a, when, the correct response when someone is discovering their geekiness for the first time is, that's awesome, hey, have you tried this other thing? I mean, that's the correct response, right? If someone says, I just, I just discovered the X-Men, this is amazing, that's awesome, what parts did you like about it? Let me introduce you to the rest of this wonderful world that you have not yet seen. I'm about to blow your mind in the best possible way. It's about being encouraging. And 
than just letting people, and just being accepting of people's wild enthusiasm. I mean, the, the biggest thing is, you know, rule one in any convention is don't break the hotel, and rule two is, <laughs> rule two is don't harsh the squeak. Do not harsh other people's squeak. Like, just, you know, act, don't tell people they are wrong for liking a thing in a general sense. Now, critiquing a thing is not the same thing as saying, oh, you like X-Men, you're just anathema. Like, that's not the same thing as saying, well, you know, that third X-Men movie was kind of problematic in the way that this thing happened and the other thing happened, and wow, only the white characters survived, and that's really bad. Um, but that's all you have to do. Let people be enthusiastic and join in their enthusiasm. That's how people feel welcome and connected. And now I'll stop talking, because that's the other important thing. <laughs> well, it's, it's also like you don't want, uh, like the, the corollary to that is don't, you, know, you don't want to be like, oh, wait, you're, you're, you're into X-Men and you like that character? It's like, oh, no, that, that's, that's kind of like, that's part of the harshing the squeeze, mm -hmm. but it's also be like, or someone says, well, I really, I really like X-Men, I really love this movie, but this thing didn't make sense. What do you mean it didn't make sense? Blah, blah, blah. It's like, no, the correct response is, oh, well, then, you know, I, I felt a little differently, but can you tell me more? Like, it's always, you, the last thing you want to do is jump on somebody and make them feel stupid for not knowing this thing that maybe you have been living and breathing and loving for, you know, for years, but it doesn't matter whether somebody is 16 or 60, if they show any level of enthusiasm or interest in a fandom that you enjoy, the correct response is always, oh, really? Do you want to know more? Because I have stuff here. Giant stack of comics, giant stack of books. Here are a whole bunch of links. If you are interested in learning more, I have resources for you. But I think maybe one other thing. I think it might be my, my perspective might be a little bit different because I don't I don't typically fo like directly foster communities of fandom. I'm I'm, I'm um, mentoring and facilitating uh, creators who, are, who may be, who may or may not be fans uh, uh, of the of a lot of the things that they're creating. Right. So. Um, just because somebody is writing a science fiction story doesn't mean that they're a big Doctor Who fan or something. Like that. Right. Um, so, uh, so what I what I often try to do in my mentoring is to be clear about um, the goals of the community and the goals of your relationship to it. Right. So, for example, uh, I'm not trying to attract a lot of hate, but it, I might. Uh, I often find the the show The Walking Dead to be tedious. Okay. I don't watch it either. Well, no, no, that's the thing. I do watch it religiously because I'm a because I'm a horror writer. It's it's not it's not up to me if I want to be in this business and be in this community of writing survival horror. How can I make myself ignorant of this show, which is obviously popular and influential in the popular culture? Right? It's not an option for me as a professional because I'm a creator. If it were simply a matter of my fandom, I can watch what I like and and turn it off in the middle of the episode if I get bored. Uh, but I have an obligation to watch these things, right? And so, so what I tell my mentees and my students is to say, you know, you have an obligation to become parts of the communities in which you want to participate, all right? And it's not simply a matter of, you know, what gives you the happiest feelings or something like that. Like, if you're doing your due diligence, you'll be part of these. And the modeling, which I'm glad this came up earlier, is about not being dismissive of people who are fans of it, right? So if I'm, you know, I mentioned our book Apocalypse Man is a survival horror book of which a lot of our readership are people probably who watch The Walking Dead. And I, you know, like, I, I, there are parts of the show I do enjoy, right? So the, 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 you can be part of this community, you can be part of the larger conversation, um, without necessarily like fanboying or fangirling or fan, uh, fanning out about it. Like I think that, that part of the modeling comes in saying, what is it to discuss the medium to which we're all attracted, even if what brings us there is for very, very different reasons. And I think, I think there's some kind of useful teaching to be done in, in that space as well. Yeah, I think um, my husband actually talks about how he, like, he know, he's always really feeling weird about the word, calling himself the word fan, mm. because, I mean, part of the reason we started dating was because he, you know, like, he heard that I liked Buffy, and I liked comics, and now I'm married. Um, <laughs> That's how it happens. <laughs> yeah, it kind of does. Uh, but I participate in fandom in a very different way than he does. Mm. He, you know, he likes to read science fiction, we watch, we watch a lot of the same TV shows, uh, you know, we will talk about this, it's a, it's a very large part of our relationship, but he does not do the big fan squeak. 
Um, I will fancy we out at the drop of a hat. I met Mary McDonald yesterday, and I was like walking on cloud nine for hours. Um, but he has a very different reaction to it, and it's always a you know. The, a, initially, I had to do a check on myself to be like, just because somebody is not at that sweet level that I am, it doesn't mean that they're any less of a fan than I am. It is okay to be a casual fan. You don't have to be someone who is like obsessed with this stuff and buying things at the convention and knowing every little bit about Dr. Who trivia, you can still be a fan without being in that level. There are multiple levels of fandom, and I think that's something that we have to keep remembering. So let's move on to the, uh, the idea of mentoring other mentors, because I know, at least in, in uh, everyone up here has associations with other communities, other leaders, other mentors. Um, what is your experience with um, checking in with others and making sure that you're learning from each other and mentoring each other in the way that that? I'm a librarian. What I do is connect people to information. Like, <laughs> so for me, if I get to the point where I'm out of my depth, but I know that someone else can be helpful in a particular context, um, I'm the queen of sending an email and saying, hey, I have this student who's working on a project, deeply enthusiastic about this thing that you happen to be an expert in, expert person. Um, would you mind if I connected them with you? You know, it's, it's good to ask, because not everybody has the bandwidth at a particular point in time do something, but when they do, um, you know, the best thing you can do is help people make those connections because that's the other part of community is, you know, respecting people's time um, and making sure that the closer connections when they happen are welcome on both sides. Similar to what Mitchie said earlier with, uh, with it's important to have that network. I totally just cut you off, I'm sorry. No, I was just gonna say, I, this is the best, I think this is one of the best parts about being in their community and having been around long enough that you've started to meet people like everybody up here. I have met through some kind of convention or because I saw their work online and I started following them and maybe like chatting them up and it is, the best feeling in the world when I can sit, when someone comes to me and says I'm looking for this thing and I can say I can't help you but I know who can that is and or if somebody comes to me and says like hey so I know you're like you shared this essay with me that you're working on and I like this this and this but that paragraph over there is going to be a problem I can't really quite help you with it but I know somebody who can um, ment uh, working with other mentors is super incredibly important to help me avoid missteps before they hurt somebody. Or for some, or if I do make a misstep, if I have a colleague who will call me out to be like, "Hey, I know you're well intentioned, but that thing you did or you said is not really going to help you." And taking my ego out of that and being able to understand that this is somebody who's not. Um, Marianne Mohan Raj has this really great metaphor for how you deal with people telling you that you've done something that is problematic. It's not they're telling you that you're a bad person, it's like they're telling you, hey, you have this booger on your nose and you kind of, you like, you don't want that booger to be showing, so maybe you might want to like go take a tissue somewhere and clean that up. Um, all that somebody's telling you is that you have something that maybe you don't want is going to be embarrassing. I'm just trying to help you out. So mentors, helping other mentors, and helping us be better people, that helps us model the type of behavior that we want the people that we are helping to see us doing. Uh, you know, it's, I just want to say, ladies and gentlemen, and keeps raising his hand there. If you haven't seen him. Oh, goodness. Oh, uh, Team Rocket. Yes. Oh, James? No, it's OK. I'll wait till the question's so. done. We do have. We've got about seven minutes left, and I wanted to congratulate our audience for picking the exact number of questions that would fill the time of the day. <laughs> uh, I don't know how you came so prepared, but congratulations. Um, we, we did have one more question left, and then I, I can get yours. So if we want to lightning around this one, would yeah. that be good? Uh, so the final question that we had was uh, the perception of the mainstream geek culture. Uh, how is it different? Uh, today, as opposed to 10, 20, 30 years ago, and um, what does that 
have to do with the landscape of, of mentoring others? Does it make it harder? Does it make it easier? I can find merch everywhere. Uh, yes, you can. <laughs> <laughs> like the, the, the fact that I can go into a Barnes and Noble and find Doctor Who merch. Um, I'm married to a collector. He still marvels. He, he marvel. I, I'm allowed to wear my Doctor Who T-shirts because when he was buying T-shirts in the 90s, you bought it and you put it on a shelf because you might never find one again. I can now buy them and actually wear them and wash them and enjoy them um, because I can I can replace it if it dies. It's when it's that ubiquitous. Um, it makes it easier to find your people, which is awesome. Um, but it also makes it feel sometimes slightly less special because there's not as much of a hunt, I guess. Um, I would say that one of the things is like, it's easy, uh, news about somebody messing up or doing something that might have been a problem in the community trap does not travel, did not travel nearly as fast 30 years ago. It does travel fast now because we have Twitter uh, so one of the you know one of the things that I would tell a men, you know somebody I'm mentoring now as opposed to 30 years ago is to really double check your work. Make sure uh, if you are writing pieces, fact check the hell out of it. Make sure you have beta readers. Beta readers are your friends. They will help you point out things that maybe you have missed. So it's always really important to stop, think about what you are going to say before you before you say it because once you do. It's out there in the world, and you're not going to be able to take it back, and there are screenshots. Well, it's interesting. I mean, I wrote the book Afrofuturism um, largely because I, when I discovered the term, I couldn't find a book on Afrofuturism. And so that was a big inspiration because I felt like there are a lot of people who were Afrofuturists or connected with those concepts, and, and just where would they find information on it? Uh, you know, there are some scholarly journals, but you know, short of you being in grad school, in some cases, you're just not going to run across them. I had been writing about entertainment, you know, most of my professional career, and I hadn't run across the term. I said, okay, you know, we need to, to do something about this so people can see themselves in a, a larger framework. Um, so that said, you know, the other day I was looking through Vogue, and they were mentioned, uh, they described an outfit as Afrofuturistic. So, oh, oh. <laughs> uh, you know, so it's like, wow, this is moving fast. Uh, <laughs> and, and it's exciting because you have conferences, you have discussion groups, you have, you know, there was a sketch comedy team here that was doing something around Afrofuturism. So now uh, there are a lot of people engaged with the conversation, which is, which is a good thing because there's more ways to express it. Uh, and I just like connecting people. And you know, so people don't feel like they're Columbusing these experiences to say, oh look, but there's a group over here that's been doing this for a while, or oh that theory that you're working on, you know what? Someone came up with that theory like 100 years ago. So here's some work, um, you know, here's somebody else working on that same concept. So that there's not this idea of feeling alone, or that they're even the sense that they're the first person ever to think these things. Um, I, I just like helping to put stuff in framework. Uh, you know, I, I want to hear from some of these other questions, but I'll just say briefly, I think the only thing I have to say I think is kind of comes out of the similar was that what Yatasha just offered. I, I like to encourage young writers and artists to think of the changing landscape of geek culture less as uh, something that you kind of passively receive and wade into, but something that you more actively change and, and terraform, right? Like this is something that, uh, it's not so much that the, the, the world keeps changing and we have to keep adapting to it, so much as the world keeps changing and you're part of the changes that are happening. So what is the contribution you want to make? Right, um, and, and I, I, I try to approach it from that. Terraforming geek culture needs to be a hashtag now. <laughs> <laughs> I've never authored a hashtag before, that's very exciting. <laughs> Team Rocket, you had a question? Yes, one question I want to address, and it's an issue that I've had um, during my geekiness growing up, and that is minorities within a fandom. And that is, I am a 20-something young man who has enjoyed a lot of things that, and has been squelched a lot because I've been told that I'm not, that I shouldn't enjoy these things because 20-something young men shouldn't be into certain things. So my question is, as mentors, how do you cope with and help minorities within a fandom gain acceptance within that fandom, if at all? 
Helping people connect, find, basically, like, it's again comes down to really helping to build the community, finding ways to connect, you know, you know, connect you with other people who share your interests or other people who have expertise and can be like, well, I don't know it. Like, if someone comes to me like, well, where do I find furry fandoms? I'm like, I don't really know, but I think I know somebody who does. So let me go talk to them and see what I can find out for you. Um, I think those are that's that is one of the best things that you can do is help someone find their community because you might know more and might have more resources than they do. Anybody else want to do this? Yes, sir. The only thing I didn't hear mentioned is is encouraging your nerds to be accepting and open to the other nerds they see at school. My son was a real good student and always into the nerd stuff. We've taken him to conventions since he was tiny. But he went to a 99% a, 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 a minority high school. And I just had him focus on his friends and find the kids that were getting picked on and say, you know what, I think your shirt is cool. I think the way you're doing your hair is cool. And it changed the culture at his school that there was a time I was bringing a carload of kids that looked like nothing you would have believed from nerddom. And they were all talking about papers they were turning in and sources they were going to be owned and all this stuff because by accepting the smart, nerdy kids, they made it cool to be smart and nerdy at their school. And they were just another group that was equal to the athletes and whoever. But be encouraging to, to find the positive and to be positive. So that may be a question we need to answer just on the side as we are at the end of our time. I think we can circle just, that back up to um, just really quick and circle that. That's what we talk about when we say modeling good behavior. Yep. When we are modeling what we want our what we want our community to be like, that is what we are doing up here. That's what we do when we talk to people and bring them into the community. It's like if you want to be like we are welcoming. Therefore, you should be too. This is what you should be going and taking out into your own communities as well. And uh, I think that about does it. It is. Uh, it's 11:45. I want to thank all of our panelists up here. Can we get a round of applause? I want to give you some round of applause for giving the exact number of questions that we can answer in an hour. I know. This is fantastic. Uh, and please, uh, please hashtag Geek Mentors on Twitter, on Facebook, and please uh, look out for their work so you can find all of their information on the PowerPoint. I'm sure you've been looking at it for the past hour, and enjoy the rest of the con.